Good afternoon, viewers. You're welcome to yet another episode of your program, your favorite program, uh, Voices of Faith. And today we're bringing you uh, a man of God all the way from Chicago. A man, uh, I call him the indefatigable pastor. Senior Special Apostle, Pastor C.I. Akonde of City Bible Church, the district chairman. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, our viewers will want to know who is Pastor Akonde? Uh, pastor Akande is the pastor at um, CNS Church Movement in Chicago. We are located on the south side of Chicago. And thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for honoring our invitation. You're welcome. The purpose of this program actually is to encourage for posterity and to debunk certain myths and misinformation about Christianity. And we have in mind no other than one person that we know that is deep in the faith and knows the way of the Lord, and you've been called for quite a long time, you know we'll be able to throw some light on some misinformation out there about Christianity, most especially about white garment churches. So to you, sir, uh, what informed your decision to convert to Christianity, or you were born a Christian? Well, there's nothing like somebody being born into Christianity, but uh, somebody have to introduce you to Christianity. Uh, my mother, of blessed memory, um, uh, she was a Christian when I was born. She was the one that I can say forced me into it. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, I have to make a personal decision uh, to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Uh, I have to confess him. You know, this is Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Everyone has to confess him. So nobody is born into Christianity. You can be going to church with somebody. But at the end of the day, you have to make a decision. You have to really confess him. Romans 10, 9. So what you are telling our viewers that that is a personal decision. It's not something that your family, your tribe, or your people can force you into. No, it's a personal decision. They can influence your decision to come to him for you to accept him. But because uh, your pastor, your daddy is a pastor, does not mean that because of that you are a Christian. It does not mean take you to heaven at all. Sir, going by your uh, background, yes. you are from a very powerful Ibadan family, uh, both in politics and in business. One would have expected you to toe the line of your brothers. What kind of influenced your decision to stick with Christ, even uh, at the expense of, I know you were under pressure to join the family business, to join your brother, Mr. Uh, Ari Akonde and his business endeavors, but you decided strongly to stick with Christ. Well, initially, it's not something that uh, I wanted to do willingly, you know, but as time goes on, when it was prophesied to me that the Lord, the calling was so much that initially, just like anybody else, I did not want to do it. But the Lord says that there were a lot of warning to my life that if I don't accept the calling that God says is going to take everything away from me. And this is what really happened uh, when I refused. A time came that my brother, whom I was working for then, decided that he's no more coming to America. And here I have my family in America. We just started the church. And because of that, well, I just said, that, well, I have to uh, just accept the calling from the Lord. And that's what really happened. Thank you, sir. How many children, children do you have, sir? I have two fantastic boys. Name, if we may know. I have Gideon Akonde and I have Tolu Akonde. And your wife? And my wife, Antonia Akonde. Um, we do believe that you have a very strong relationship with your family. And um, we've been told before we actually got here that you are a family man. Do you put your family before Christ or Christ before the family? Well, it is very easy. It's, it's very easy to say, but it's also very difficult. It is true that the Bible says that if any, uh, in Luke 14, 26, the Bible says, uh, if anybody wants to follow him, that he has to uh, forgo his parents. But, huh, what can I say? 
Yes, the Bible said that your family shall come first. Then the Bible said you shall love God with all your mind, body, and soul. It is a very, very difficult thing to do. You try to be there for your wife, for your children, but when you are actually in the ministry, it is very, very difficult. So it's like if you have your mother here and you have your wife here, you have to please the two of them. That's the way I look at it. You know, but when it comes to making decisions with Christ, I try to let that of Christ to come first. That is really encouraging because we've seen so many marriages break up, leaders in Christianity, because they focus too much or so much on the church at the detriment of their family. So you've been able to have a work or a Christian life family relationship balance. How did you maintain that? And what are the challenges that you face? <laughs> With the help of God. Uh, it's not by my power. It's only by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, if I sit down here and say that um, I took care of my wife, my children, the way I'm supposed to, I would be lying to you. Um, but I thank God that my wife um, wanted to be a nun initially. So when it comes for us to be in the ministry, that sort of helped me. You know, for instance, now if I say I want to go fasting, she's ready to go fasting with me. Hmm. You know, and then of course, when my children were young, I started to let them know what Christianity means about that you have to accept Christ, other other stuff. Uh, let me give you an example. For instance, now uh, my children went to a university outside Chicago. I didn't have time to go all the time to visit them where they are. It's just impossible. But I tried to communicate with them. You know, I try to do what I can do. And I always pray that God let my children come up well. But it's not because of what I have done. It's not because of what my wife has done. It's only by the grace of God. So there is a correlation, a direct correlation between success in the ministry and the wife that you, that you get married to. It matters a lot that your partner, you know, it, say, it takes uh, a must three, three. You say, can two work with that not agreeing? You know, and then it takes, you know, iron chapman, iron chapman, chapman, iron chapman, iron, iron. But I thank God that uh, God gave me my own wife. That's all I can say. So the next question is, if you have uh, uh, somebody comes across you on the mm -hmm. street right now, mm -hmm. and the question is, what will be your greatest legacy as a leader, a founder, an evangelist of Christ? How would you describe your greatest legacy? Well, I would say that um, I love the scriptures. I love the Bible. And that everything I want to do, I want to make sure that uh, it's, and my decision is based upon the word of God. And I always ask God to, me to, make my, to make my decision for me. You know, that whatever you want to do in life, you know, make sure that you are really, really, you seek the face of God. Psalm 32 verse 8 says something, you know, let the Lord direct your steps, and his eyes will be upon you. Proverbs 35 says, in everything, don't lean your own understanding. That should be that I would expect people to say about me. In this kind of environment, the Amer I'm talking about the American environment, okay. where Christianity is faced with so many challenges. Okay. Even the traditional American churches are facing their own problems right now okay. because so many people are pulling away from the faith. Okay. And the Bible recognizes that even from the time of Christ, that okay. many people are going to fall away from the faith. Okay. What are the challenges that you face as a church planter? I know you planted so many churches in America and in Nigeria. What are the ch uh, challenges that you face that are specific to the American environment? Well, one thing is that um, the CNS movement is an African or Nigerian um, was founded by the, uh, a Nigerian, or our father, St. Moses Sotimola de Tumolashe. And the mode of worship, or some of the things that we do, uh, is new to the Americans. For instance, now we have to take off our shoes. Uh, number two, some people in America don't, uh, it's difficult for them to really understand to take off their shoe. Another thing is that uh, everybody comes from in white garments. You know, then number two, most uh, people in the CNS sometimes don't want to change into English. You know, they, they, they want to be speaking in Yoruba, all that stuff. You know, but 
Uh, having said that, if somebody is really a Christian, and if Jesus Christ is really the top of, uh, of the table, one should not have any problem to worship with anybody. You know, so I don't see that as, uh, as any problem, really. I just look at it that the Lord will let me meet whomever the Lord wants me to meet. If by any chance uh, you become the head of the Chihuahua and Sarah from church, mm -hmm. what is the one thing that you will change in our mode of, in the, in the, in our mode of worship? Well, I won't say there's anything I can change in the mode of worship, um, but what I want to emphasize is that we continue to uh, express uh, what our Lord Jesus Christ taught we should continue to live a Christian life and make every decision. We saw, whatever decision we make, it should be biblical, period. Do you have anything to say to people out there that are actually saying, oh, the white garment churches is a cult? What do you have to say to them right now? Well, there's an adage in Yoruba that says, whatever, whoever has a match, whatever they say, they can say it. But I believe that everybody is accountable to God and to God only. But a lot of people who say negative things about CNS have never really experienced what CNS is. Some of them have not even been to a CNS church. You know, but they listen to what somebody is saying outside. Uh, I will expect them to, first of all, come to a legitimate CNS church to go and find things out by themselves, you know, before they make that decision. When you say legitimate C and S church, does that mean there are illegitimate C and S churches out there? Well, I always tell people that there is in any organization that is, there are bad eggs. No matter what church you go, where, whether it is, it doesn't make a difference. You will always have bad eggs. Therefore, what I'm saying is that there are some churches or some people for their own personal um personal endeavors that are really putting the church down anywhere that you go. That's what I mean by that. There has been so many claims by unbelievers. Yes. You see out there that Christianity is a fraud. Okay. Do you think Christianity is a fraud? If it's a fraud, I would not be a Christian today. You know, but it is because they don't know what they are talking about. You know, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ walked this planet. There's history. You know, that if anybody wants to find out where he was born up today, you can go to where he was born. You can go to Jerusalem. Apart from that, go and look at all the history books, all the names of the Roman Empire, all their kings. They, at the same time that a light Jesus Christ was alive, it can be attributed to it. So sometimes I wonder, nobody, we were not here when the first uh, president of the United States was here. But we read from the history about, uh, about his name, his life. We believe on that. How come we don't believe in what was written for us to understand? Christianity has been described as a way of life. Yes. What do you think should be the relationship between Christians and other religions? Well, that's a, that's a problem there because when you have two kings who don't agree, then there's a tendency for one to say that one is better than the other. You know, but one thing we know is, is as a Christian that I will say is that Jesus Christ is the Lord and is the only way to the Father and no any other way. However, we will accept everybody no matter what they are. Jesus Christ, he loved the sinner, but he hated the sin. That's all. Should, do you, in your own opinion, think there should be any reason for conflict or warfare between... Christian, a way of life, and other religion. And what should be our disposition towards other religion when they come with force, with violence, or with attack? How should we handle that kind of situation? Sir? Well, uh, Christianity is about way of life. You know, with the fruit of the Spirit, the first one is love. That we love our neighbors no matter what they believe, no matter what they do. And I'm sure that if we, if Christian is a way of life, the way we accept them, you know, we, they would come to come and say, well, something is different about this person. And because of that, they can even decide that they want to meet us. You know, so we love them. Amen. But it does not mean, but we have to be very careful. 
you know, we need, you know, the way we address them so that they don't think that we, we think that we are, we are it. We are not it. Jesus is it. So with our ways, our behavior, you know, we'll be able to let them understand that Christianity is about way of life and not about trying to uh, overcome anybody. Before we go on our commercial, I would like yeah. to ask you one more question. Yes, please, go ahead. We are, by the way, we are at City Bible Church, Chicago, Illinois, and we are with Pastor C.I. Akone. Where do you want to take, what are your dreams or your aspirations for C City Bible Church in the next two, three years? Well, the next two, three years, one of the things that we want to, we, we are planning to do, uh, by the way, we are now in a new location at 2330 uh, East 99th Street in Chicago. So one of the things that we are trying to do now is that to do a lot of bit more for evangelism, uh, radio and, uh, and television. And uh, a lot of people have been asking me to write books now, but I've been so busy. I love church planting and also church growth to help new pastors uh, about developing a church and making the church grow. question I've always loved to ask you mm -hmm. is at a point in your life you okay. were working full time. Okay. Um, I don't know in what, in what capacity, but I know it's in a, like a psychiatric mental health institution full time. And you are combining that with being a full time pastor of a church. Yes. How did you do that? Honestly, I don't know how I did it. All I know is that I, I give glory to God that I was able to do it, you know, but for me to tell you that, oh, it's by my power, it is not. Just keep doing it. What is your favorite Bible passage? Oh. When you wake up in the morning and you're about to go about your business, the first thing that comes to your mind is that Bible passage. Proverb 3, 5, and 6. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will do what? He will direct your path. So the Lord has always directed your path. We thank God for that. Praise God. For people out there that are falling away from Christianity mm -hmm. due to the information they're getting on YouTube, mm -hmm. on, social, on social media platforms, mm -hmm. like the question of tithing, mm -hmm. what is your your, your, I will say your standing when it comes to tithing, according to the Bible. There is this debate out there, oh, it's an Old Testament thing, it's not in the New Testament, giving is better than tithing. What, where do you stand? Well, it is true. Tithing is an Old Testament thing. However, in the New Testament, the New Testament expects more than the 10% means the best thing, that is, give the best that you can give unto God. So when we are talking about Titan, um, a lot of uh, unscrupulous ministers have used that for their advantage. Now, what can you give to someone that died for you? What, what are you going to give to him? And apart from that, if you look at it, let, let's go to the basic. We are talking about the church of God. Especially in America, when there's a church, you have to maintain the church. You have to pay the staff. Um, I always make a joke that I went to uh, Nyko Gas. Uh, they said, you know, Nyko Gas, and I told them that we are a church. You know, when they were asking me to pay, and then they said, what has that got to do with them? You know, so people just don't understand that uh, when you are talking about Titan, you are even supposed to give more than 10%. You know, and our Lord Jesus Christ, even... Um, I spoke about what is even more than tightened, they mentioned it. 
You know, that's what I don't understand what all the force is all about. And I think it's the enemy that is playing, you know, on the heads of people about going against tightening out what the word of God has said. The question of discipline has yes. always been a factor in the church. Okay. How do you manage discipline in your church? And what is the role of discipline in the progressive church? Well, when you are talking about discipline, sometimes people think that CNS does not have discipline. Yes, we do have discipline. You know, I love the American process of law and order. Uh, before the police can arrest someone, they will give you a long rope. You know, they'll be investigating you, investigating you to make sure that if they give someone 25 counts, there's no way that person can come out of it. And it's because they have been doing their work diligently well. So in CNS, we give, we try to work with somebody with love, you know, canceling there and there and now, there and not, you know, all, all the time, you know, showing the love to that person with the Lord to be able to show them hell. You know, Galatians chapter 1 even says that, uh, you know, if we see anybody fall, we that are in spirit will try to bring him up with love. You know, uh, number two, we don't believe in excommunication. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of our church in Nigeria excommunicated someone. Uh, our, the the Babaladra just passed away. He says that, no, we don't press excommunication. Whatever you have to do is try to bring that person you know, back. And the Bible said that if anybody should sin and you that brought him, you, you know, you, you have to bring him back. And that's a promise that's to that. So, you know, so what, what we, we tend to do is that we work with that, with that person, you know, and keep on working with that person. You know, however, there's a limit, you know. Uh, I, always, I always make a joke that uh, now the Bible said if somebody sin against you, you talk to him. If not, take two person. If not, take the church. And then after, if that doesn't work, then give into the, you know, give into Satan. And I said that is the worst thing that you can do to a believer. There's also a burning question out there about the role of Christians in traditional institutions. Okay. You are from Ibadan, and I know you are from. Ujia. Yes, are from and, I'm, and I'm proud to be from Ibadan. If today somebody calls you from the royal through, uh, yes, oh. Uh, Baba Kondi, you are the next Oba of Ibadan. Yes. What will be your answer? It's so funny. And, and if you're going to say no to it, why? It's so funny you're asking me this question because I was talking to somebody today uh, about this. Will I take kingship of a local something? And I said, no way. You know, I'm already an Oba. First Peter 2 9. I'm a kingship, a holy, you know. A royal, you know. So why will I go low to become an over? There are a couple of things that uh, I decided that in life that I will not do. Number one, I will not be a politician, you know, and I will not work any traditional to become a king in any way. And it's because um, you don't want to eat with Satan. For someone to want to really be a natural ruler or a king, there is no way, I don't know how that person would do it, not to be involved in any tech, in any of local, whatever they are doing. I don't know if that is possible. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Some people say that um, they are kings, but they don't do what other people are doing. I don't know about that. But there is no way I can leave my kingship in the servant of our Lord Jesus Christ to be a servant somewhere else. So Americans that are watching us right now, yes. what do you have to tell them about Christianity and why they must accept Christ? Well, we have to accept, you have to, number one, you have to understand that to accept Jesus Christ is for you to know that you are a sinner and we have all sinned. The Bible said, I'm first short of the glory of God. You have to come clean. You don't have to clean yourself. Don't get me wrong. You don't have to have to clean up yourself. But you have to realize to be able to know that you are a sinner. And I will not say to just, just Americans, to anybody, anybody, any nationality, whether you are Nigerian, you are Chinese, whatever it is, you know, and I believe what the Bible really says, as a matter of fact, you know, that John 3.16, that God so loved the world, you know, that he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And that Jesus Christ is the way and the true life. And I'm open to, uh, to discuss this with anybody, 
who want to know more what they can do. For people that are suffering from afflictions and okay. diseases out there, yes. uh, most of our pastors out there, yeah. I'm not talking about the white garment pastors, okay. but most pastors out there we kind of tall people out there and their selling point is always come, mm. receive your healing, receive your mm -hmm. breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And there's this thing that people are like sold to miracles mm -hmm. and that is why they want to come to Christ. Mm -hmm. As a pastor, and you've been doing this for quite a while and you have an established record of sources in doing what you're doing. Let us tell America, what does the Bible have to say about healing, salvation, and why people should come to church in the first place? Well, I don't know. You, um, you keep on saying American, American, but not only Americans, the whole world in general, you know, about what Christianity is all about. There is nothing that God cannot do. If God wants to heal somebody instantly, he will do it. Unfortunately, some people are using this as a, as a gimmick to try to bring people to our Lord Jesus Christ, which I am totally agree. Some even will be preaching only about prosperity, which is not what Christianity is all about. Christianity is about accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, it's about changing your life. It's about, it's a pity we don't have time. I would have loved to talk about the kingdom. The purpose that Christ came to this world is that so that we can be God sent Christ to this world, so we can be like his own son. That's what it's all about. So you don't come to him. I remember the story. There's a story in the Bible, if you remember. The Lord, this rich man came to our Lord Jesus Christ and asked him, what can he, how can he be saved? You know, and he left disappointed. And he left disappointed. The same thing. You know, if you come to him, just because of the bread and the butter, uh, so many times I love Jesus Christ. I have to leave his disciples, you know, and leave everybody right? because he said that all they want is because of what they want to eat. So want to come to our Lord Jesus Christ, not because of what you want to eat, but because you love him. In Romans 5, 8, the Bible said, when we were sinners, he died for us. I keep insisting and mentioning Americans because I want to see the fire of revival in America. Okay. We have this church. We bring people, draw people in from all tribes, all nations, especially where we are operating from. There are so many churches in Nigeria. Yes. But we are operating within this space. Okay. So I'm looking forward to a day where we bring people in. Another thing is, if you have the opportunity to have a church that, yeah. is strictly, that strictly evangelizes the gospel, Okay. How would you compare the role of the Bible in the white garment church and every other church? Where do we place by the Bible? Is it a priority or do we dwell on other activities more than the Bible? Hmm. I'm sure you know the story of a man in the Bible and you will tell me. The Lord told him, this word of God must never depart from you. Sure. He said, meditate on it day and night. If you remember the story of Nehemiah and Ezra, at the end of the day, and even in the book of Luke 24, after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, on the way to Emmaus, three of his disciples were discussing, and uh, you know all the story. But at the end of the day, Jesus Christ sat with them. He discussed the scriptures with them. How can someone then say that the Bible should be left behind. No, the Bible should be what should control us. The scriptures is only what we need that can change our life. And the Bible said, faith come by hearing, hearing Amen. the word of God. And it's that word of God that we have to know. Uh, there is this uh, classic book called The Pilgrim's, uh, the Pilgrim's Progress. Okay. Christian left his wife, okay. his children, okay. and followed the Lord. Okay. In this environment, whether Nigeria or all over the world, mm -hmm. is it biblical for a man to abandon his family in order to follow the call of the gospel? I don't think that's appropriate for someone to abandon his family. No. The first thing is that one has to take care of his family. Awesome. And of course, you also have to win them over, no matter what you want to do. 
And then, so what is the ones. best way of winning people over? Somebody once said a, a very powerful Chiribu and Seraphim mm -hmm. man is dead now. God bless his soul. Said, your character shall so much in my head that I cannot hear what you are saying. What do you think we should focus more? The knowledge of the Bible or our character? Both. Now, if you have the knowledge of the Bible, and the Bible says that love your neighbor as yourself. If you know the Bible, and the Bible says that Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2.21, he left an example for us to follow. He washed the feet of his disciples. He asked us to do the same thing. Then you practice what the Bible said. And it's only by that. Talking to you, uh, uh, the Spirit is giving me John chapter 4. When the Lord Jesus Christ made that woman at the well, she did not accuse her of anything. And then to the extent that this woman came to accept him, she ran to the village to go and say, come and meet. I met a man who told me everything about myself. And because of that statement, because our Lord Jesus Christ accepted her and then loved her, she went back. So the same thing that we do have to do, love somebody no matter that is what. Very, that is very interesting, sir. Because the, what actually converted that woman was Jesus' prophetic message. Not uh, only that. Before then, before the prophetic message, Jesus Christ sat down and said, give me a cup of water. He, he started a conversation, you know, that really made the woman to now relax. When she now relaxed, then she said, ah, ah, if not because the way he relaxed, the way he wanted to talk to her. If you remember, Jews and Samaritans, they have nothing to do together. With Our Lord Jesus Christ was past that discrimination and said, well, hello there. There's nothing as good as when you meet somebody and you try to uh, talk to them. You accept them. So, and it's because of that discussion that she was able to say, you must be the son of God. So it's not the prophetic. It's, it's the first thing, the interaction that first, that first came before the prophecy. If you don't interact with somebody, how do you want to I am going somewhere with that, with that uh, declaration of yes. prophetic message. Okay. In our churches. Yes. Uh, God has given us that gift. So the glory of, of God. Prophetic yes. ministry. Yes. And it's very strong. It's alive mm -hmm. in that ministry. Yes. But on the other side, mm -hmm. it's also the reason why most people run away from white garment churches. Mm -hmm. I've had friends that will come I don't want anybody to see vision. I'm here to worship God. Mm -hmm. The moment you want to see vision, and why do they say that? They've seen people, they are frosters in the house of Christ, mm -hmm. everywhere, in mm -hmm. every denomination. Of course. People will give prophecies of course. and separate husband and wife. Of course. We give prophecy and make uh, a, a man to hate his mother and of his course. siblings. Of course. How can we effectively manage the prophetic ministry to make it the tool that will bring people in and not turn people away from it? Well, why are people against prophecy? Number one, a lot of people, they know they want the prophecy when it is good, when it favors them. Hey, hallelujah. Just like what they did to our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, you are the Lord, you are the Lord. And when it comes to say, no, crucify him, crucify him. When the prophecy suits them, they appreciate it. But when the prophecy comes to trying to tell them to change their lifestyle, that's when they are really against prophecy. However, I also know that sometimes when people are prophesying, they look at that person as just an, an ordinary human being. They look at him that, who are you to come and tell me all this stuff? Now, again, a lot of people have used prophecy wrongly for their own personal advertisement. And it's also, it's, I'm sorry to say, that some who call themselves prophets of prophetesses, their lifestyle does not agree with what the Bible is saying. Therefore, some people tend to not to believe uh, what the prophecy is saying or want to go against it. But one thing that we always say to new entrants is that if you come to church, Jesus Christ is the person you look at. He is the founder. Man is fallible. Viewers, man is fallible. Jesus Christ is not. You don't come because of one person. The Lord Jesus Christ is the author 
and finisher of our faith. This church has been established by Christ. <coughs> it's been in operation for over 40 years. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. What are your plans for if the Lord were to call you to be or continue the next generation that will take over from you, from the elders? I know you've made disciples. How are, you be, how are you able to maintain those disciples and pass down the baton to the coming generation so that we, this church will continue? Christ City Bible Church will continue in the future. Well, you remind me the story of uh, the story of Moses. When Moses is about to go to pass away, the Lord called Joshua and said, Joshua, you are taking the baton from Moses. Joshua was afraid, but the, the Lord told him, so don't worry. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. For anyone who has started something, you want to pray to the Lord that even when you are no more there, when you pass away to where the Lord wants you to pass away, that you pray that that should be continuation of what you started. No wonder nowadays you have a father and sons. You start a company, you hope that your children, everybody, Continue. So you pray. But one of the things that we do is that while you are there, you try to teach people. You know, uh, for instance, in this church, we are Bible based. We base a lot of things on the Bible. You know, even if you are praying, you have to use the scriptures to pray. Number two. Number three, you try to bring people. You know, sometimes if you come to this church, it's not my church, to this church, you might not find some elders, nearly nobody on the altar. Because we have gone to different churches to minister, you know. And so we are trying to bring all, all the youth of everybody up, you know, so that when we are not there, they can easily, the church will still be running, no matter what. So that's what we do. Uh, I, I also believe that one of my ministry is, to, uh, is for church growth. You know, people don't understand that. One thing that is confusing a lot of our viewers out there mm -hmm. is that most churches want to pass the baton from father to son. I know in our church, just like in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. they engage a lot of spiritual mm -hmm. praying, yeah. fasting for God to choose a leader. Mm -hmm. What do you think should be the order of the day? How should we choose our leaders? Okay. So, now, there are two things that people get confused. A ministry is different from a church. In a ministry is the one that is founded by one person, and he is the CEO. If the CEO decided that, well, I want my son, that's nothing. In a ministry, there's nobody organizing, you know, that the person reports to. That's a ministry. So they can do it. But a church, a church has a body in which the pastor or the senior pastor is accountable to. Okay? So now, it also depends on every church what their constitution say. What did the constitution say? Does the constitution say that, well, this is how you elect a new leader? So if the organization have already had a constitution about how leadership, you know, should be, should be, should be held, then that's what they should follow. But in the olden days, yes. in the, I, know, I cannot tell you what was yeah. in the olden days. The mm -hmm. modus operandi in those days okay. Okay. was that there was nowhere in the world where you have a church that passes mm -hmm. from father to son. It's mm -hmm. always like an head up council, we come together and say this is what the Lord says. That is true. That but is now true. the question of ministry and churches is coming into the uh, into church operation. But most people are of the opinion mm -hmm. that we should go back to the old ways, where the Lord will choose, just like in the Bible. Well, as I said, the ministry is different from the church. From the church. They don't have no organize, nobody to report to. But the church is different. Any church that is trying to pass the baton to his son or a family members, normally even nowadays we have some problems because everybody knows that that is not what should happen. If the God calls you home today, yeah. what would you like to be written on your tombstone? I love Jesus. Just I love Jesus. Hey. I love Jesus. Wait. 
would you like to address our viewers as we round up our interview? Well, hello viewers, uh, we thank you. Please, uh, as they say, share, share, share. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, whatever it is, I know that uh, I would like to address some people who have left the church because somebody uh, did something to them. Um, I want to let you know that uh, whatever it is, uh, you still have to settle with people, no matter where you go. Don't let what people have done for you to make you to run away from the church. church. Jesus is waiting for you. He has plans for you. And human beings are human beings. There's something we talk about grace. Forgive people. Because you too, you must have stepped on somebody's toes and they forgive you. And if Jesus Christ can forgive you, why don't you forgive somebody else and go back to your church? The reason you are in the church is because God has given you uh, a gift which you are supposed to use in the church. You cannot use it elsewhere. Please, obey your calling. Wherever you have been calling to, 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 to be, do it, and the Lord will bless you. So once again, we, I want to thank the organizer. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I pray that uh, I pray for success in everything that you want to do and that God will use it mightily for his kingdom. God bless you. Thank you, viewers, for watching us. You've heard it all from the pastor, a great man of God, a man that I describe as indefatigable, even at this advanced age, is still flying all over the world, preaching the gospel of Christ. And we pray that the Lord will continue to increase you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Thank Have you. a nice day. Oh,